I'm William Cooper, and you're listening to The Hour of the Time, brought to you by Swiss America Trading. Welcome, Will, once again to The Hour of the Time. Thanks, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, tonight, we uh, decided that we're going to talk about some of the symbology connected with the rites of Freemasonry, uh, the secret symbols of identification, and uh, things of that nature. Uh, wherever you want to start, go right ahead. Okay, well, <clears throat> um, all the important symbols and uh, 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 and passwords are, are incorporated into the first three degrees. Um, the the handshake, I think, is the most widely used Masonic uh, uh, symbol. It uh, it consists of an ordinary handshake, except the thumb of the person who is a mason goes onto the third knuckle of the right hand of the person he's shaking hands with. If you've ever shaken hands with somebody and they seem to have a funny grip, or possibly even, I always thought it seemed kind of feminine to me because the hand just wasn't strongly wrapped around your hand when you're shaking hands with somebody, you can have a pretty good idea that they're trying to feel you out and see whether you're a mason like they are. The uh, first two degrees, that was the hand grip of the third degree, the first two degrees are the same except first degree, the thumb goes on the first knuckle, and the second degree, the thumb goes on the second knuckle. But uh, those are very, very rarely used. And in the master mason, or the third degree, the thumb is on the third knuckle. That's correct? Uh, yes, sir. And, uh, and how would you reply to that if you were, in fact, a, a Freemason? Um, you do the exact same. It becomes a, a combined grip, and your thumb is on his third knuckle, and his thumb will be on your third knuckle. And... Uh, uh, it's, uh, you can't miss it if somebody tries to slip you this handshake. So it's it's not really a true handshake in the in the uh, in the sense of the word that most people have learned to shake hands. You don't have a full grip of the other person's hand, but rather you just have a sort of a loose grip uh, on their fingers, and your thumb is either on the first, second, or third knuckle, and you're sort of digging with that thumb to try to get a reaction to see if the other person is uh, is indeed a Freemason. And at what level? Uh, that, that's that's true. Uh, that, that's true. And if uh, if they do not respond as such, uh, the person will withdraw his hand quickly. But if he's not sure, he'll seem to kind of extend his grip just a little bit to kind of give you a chance to to uh, return the uh, return the sign. They call it a sign. Now, uh, besides the the handshake, what other uh, signs or signals uh, are used to identify one Freemason to another? The most subtle one, and the one that you often have to look out for in public places, is how a man stands. His the position of his feet will be a dead giveaway. Most people stand in just a, a leisurely uh, a position with their feet. Uh, um, pointing outward just a slight, just slightly, but a, uh, a Freemason will stand with his feet in an exact square at a right angle, heel to heel. This is the uh, this is the step they call the step of a master Mason. The step of an entered apprentice, a first degree Mason, uh, is where the uh, the feet form a sort of T with the heel going to the cup of the other foot, and the uh, second degree is an inverse of the third degree with the uh, a, a, another square being formed. So. If you see someone standing in a room with their two heels joined together and their feet forming a perfect right angle or a 90 degree angle, uh, you can pretty much bet that that's such an unnatural stance that that is a dead giveaway that that person is a master mason. Unnatural and uncomfortable, I might add, to, <laughs> to anybody who's stood there. You're, you're forced to stand like this when you uh, become initiated, You and also when you return the ritual, you have to do memory work and memorize the ritual and then give it back before you are uh, raised to the <clears throat> sublime degree of a master mason. 
uh, yeah, it's it, it's a dead giveaway because nobody stands like that uh, naturally. It's just not a comfortable position to stand. And why would someone stand like that? Would they do that in a room full of strangers to let other Freemasons who might be in the room know that it's okay to come and uh, and uh, have some kind of a fellowship with them because uh, they're a Freemason? I myself have stood just like that for that very purpose. Uh, because it, it's just noticeable. Uh, it's it's a way of broadcasting who you are and talking to the rest of the world without the rest of the world being able to interpret what exactly you are saying. In other words, if you're not a Mason, you might look over and say, oh, boy, that guy's kind of a, a, a nut. Look at the way he's standing. Uh, whereas a Freemason would say, uh, that's, that's a brother of the craft. I'm going to go and... Uh, and to meet this fellow. Absolutely, that's uh, that's generally the way it works. Uh, uh, most people just aren't aware of, uh, of of all these signs and symbols uh, incorporated into the craft. But a mason lives and breathes these things. Every time he goes to lodge, he uh, he takes on this position. He does the hand signals. He gives the he uh, well often he usually gives the handshake to his fellow brothers just to keep in practice. These these things are are so much a part of masonry and of masons that uh, that they spot them wherever they go. Okay, so we know the handshake, we know the heel-to-heel -heel in the right angle. Uh, we talked uh, in the last broadcast about uh, uh, I raise my hand to the square or I raise my arm to the square. And what are some of the others? Well, the, uh, the others are the hand signals, and these are also used in every single lodge meeting. And uh, these are, to Masons, these are what uh, are most easily and most commonly used to uh, communicate between Masons their identity. Of the uh, of the first degree, you uh, the uh, hand signal is you take your uh, left hand palm upward and put it near your waist, and then your right hand palm downward just above your left hand, uh, forming a bit of a cube, and you hold your hands like like such, uh, and that's the symbol, the hand signal, of the first degree. Now the penal sign, as they call it, is taking the right hand and drawing it in a slashing motion across the neck, and this refers to the penalty of the first degree, which is having your throat slit from ear to ear. Now, if this were truly a benevolent fraternal organization, why in the world would they have an oath and a penal sign uh, to tell uh, other members that uh, that they could have their throat slit. And there are many others, depending upon what degree and what oath we're talking about. Uh, why, why would they do that if they were really and truly a benevolent fraternal organization, bearing in mind that grown men take their oaths very uh, seriously if they understand the oaths and they're not being defrauded or, or lied to when they take the oath. Um, and uh, fully intend to carry out whatever oath that they take. This is not a, a joke. They're not children. Uh, this is not play on the playground. Uh, the, the question answers itself. You're absolutely right. They, this is not a joke. In fact, it's deadly serious. Uh, these are the heart secrets of the majority of the craft. Even though they're not illuminated brethren, even though they, they don't really know what's going on around them or what they're doing, they have sworn to keep these secrets above all else because this, uh, if a, a, a non-Mason or a member of the profane knows these secrets, he can just walk right into a lodge and, and sit down and, and uh, be exposed to everything within. Hmm, I hope you're listening, folks. Uh, now, just for the benefit of, of our listeners or someone who may have just turned in or tuned in, turned in, uh, are any of your fellow brother Masons out here who may be listening? Now, you took the oath, but you're revealing the secrets. Why are you revealing the secrets if you took the oath? Uh, because I took the oath under uh, a fraudulent... Uh, a contract as such. I was told that it was a benevolent organization, that it dealt with charity, that it was uh, arranged around God. All three of those things are bold-faced lies, and I can prove their falsehood. Uh, in fact, anybody can prove their falsehood with, with just a, a moment's bit of research. Uh, there are many more reliable sources than I for information that you can go to to find out the true nature of this craft. And uh, many religions in the world, including the, the Baptist and the Mormons, have condemned Freemasonry as, as being exactly what it purports not to be. It's not benevolent, it's not charity organi organized, and it's not centered around God. Well, it's, it's funny that you mention that the Mormons have condemned Freemasonry when they carry out the exact same rituals that are carried out in a Masonic Lodge in their temple ceremonies, and uh, most uh, Mormons are indeed, as was Joseph Smith, uh, members of the Masonic Lodge. Uh, our research shows that the public statements of the Mormon Church are often, and I mean often, contradictory to their true beliefs and what they really practice in their daily lives in, within the temple. 
they are in fact a secret uh, society, a secret organization that practices the same rites as the Masonic Lodge uh, within their temple and have the same goal and that is that the practitioners of the religion of the Mormon Church will in fact become God and that is of course what the um, other secret societies and we're talking right now the Freemasons they're really all the same organization they're working toward becoming God. It, it is. It's a quest after Godhood. And uh, uh, all I can say about the Mormons and their many, many similarities to Masons is that a pagan is a pagan is a pagan. It, it's nature worship. Uh, they believe in the laws of the universe as, as being what they have to answer to. And, and, manip and if you know these laws, you can manipulate the populace. It, it's elitism at its, at its very best. Now, let me ask you this for the benefit of our listeners also. Many people write me letters and say, hey, my, my dad or my uncle or my cousin or my friend um, is a Freemason, and I've asked them about these things, and they've told me that, that it's not true, um, that it's all a lie. Um, will Freemasons lie to hide the truth? Every single time, if the truth will give away what they don't want to give away. In fact, I've been lied to by, by, by brothers in the craft that, that are allegedly or supposedly teaching me and instructing me in what goes on. They, if they told the truth, it would scare away their members and would, it would end up in universal condemnation of what they're doing. No uh, reasonable and uh, moral person could, uh, could possibly subject, subject themselves to such bloody oaths and to such total secrecy. Uh, not only that, but the oaths themselves, they're sworn to secrecy. So if you were to ask them to tell you the secrets or the truth about the practices, the rituals, uh, the, the true religion of the Masonic Lodge, they are sworn uh, not to tell you. So therefore, they would, they would have to lie. And the only reason that you are telling is because you discovered that, that uh, uh, the oaths that you had taken and the purposes for which you thought the Masonic fraternity was organized, uh, it just is not true at all. So therefore, um, everything that you participated in, you participated in under fraudulent conditions. Uh, yeah, uh, that is exactly true, and as such, I don't consider myself to be bound by those oaths because I was lied to before I entered into those oaths. Uh, this is common law. This is the law of, of many lands, uh, it's, and it also makes, just, it makes perfect common sense that uh, both parties have to know what is going on in all terms of the contract before they can be held accountable for, for their deeds within that contract. That's correct. And the oath that you the oath that you took you thought were for a different purpose and to a different God than the God that you discovered and the purpose that you finally discovered. So, folks out there, when you go and ask your relatives or your friends or your cousins or your business uh, associates uh, questions about the lodge, about Freemasonry, about any secret society, no matter what name it is, the Rosen Cross, Knights Templars, um, the Knights of Malta, the Order of Saint John of Jerusalem, any of these people. They cannot and will not tell you the truth because it is forbidden to them. And in fact, if they do, they could find themselves suffering the consequences of the very oaths they took, not to reveal these secrets. Now, what are some of the other signs that we, that we have not discussed? Okay, I covered the first degree. The second degree we've, we've also partially covered. Uh, the, uh, the sign of the second degree is to hold your right arm extended outward with the, uh, 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 the elbow at a right angle and the, uh, the hand facing up, palm forward. And uh, uh, the uh, penal sign of that is to draw your right hand across your chest from left to right in a claw-like motion, which refers to the penalty of the second degree, which is to have your breast torn open and your heart and vials taken thence and uh, given as uh, to the birds of the... Bird of the, uh, the air and uh, beast of the field. That's an exact quote from the ritual, by the way. And uh, the third degree um, consists of uh, uh, both hands, uh, palm down, extended uh, outward at the waist, uh, and then to draw the, uh, the hand across the waist from left to right, which refers to have your body torn in twain, which is the penalty of the, revealing the secrets of the third degree, is to have your body torn in twain and the parts carried north and south. That is, again, a direct quote from the ritual. So the first one uh, is the recognition signal, and the second is what you call the penal 
sign. Yes, yes, that's true. And are there other signs and signals uh, connected with Freemasonry? There are there are many others. Um, there is a, a recognition signal uh, and a penal sign for every single degree in Freemasonry. And I have been through the 32nd degree and uh, have uh, have uh, experienced all these uh, recognition signals and uh, penal signs. But the uh, all the signs after the third degree are not nearly as important as the uh, first three. And for the reason for this is, is because Masons in general uh, are just not invited to know all the secrets of the order. Um, it is not uncommon to know a Mason, as you've stated before, who never ever advances beyond the third degree. And I should state now that a Mason who, uh, who is in the third degree, he can be the master of his lodge, uh, the worshipful master, they call it, of his lodge, which is uh, a bit like an elected, it is an elected office, a bit like president that lasts for one year. Uh, not all Masons are in the Scottish Rite or the Shrine or the Yorkish Rite, but all Masons do know the signs of the first three degrees and the penal signs. And in fact, most Masons um, are really only guilty of joining an organization they know nothing about and for giving it um, uh, protection and, uh, and favor and helping it along, but they really don't know what it's all about, do they? True, true. They, they, they don't. They're, uh, they're as ignorant as I was. And uh, if, if they're out there listening, I'd like to say that you can follow the exact same path I have followed. Now that you know the truth about the craft, whether you believe me or not, you should go out and verify for yourself. And once you do verify for yourself, you are no longer bound by those oaths either. They are fraudulent, and they are, they're, they're ridiculous and unreasonable and brutal in many ways. Not only that, but once you do know about it, you are no longer innocent, but you are if you don't do something about it or leave the lodge or do as this young gentleman is doing help us to um, to relieve ourselves from the yoke of these secret societies who are planning on stripping us of our freedoms and our rights if you don't then you are um, then you are a fellow conspirator and are just as guilty as those who have always known and you better understand that because I'm telling you right now, patriots in this country are getting fed up. And the purpose of this show is to prevent bloodshed. We want to wake people up and do something about this while we can, legally and lawfully, because, uh, folks, there, there will come a day when people will not take it anymore, and they will take weapons in hand, unfortunately. Um, we can see it coming. Anybody with half a brain can look around and talk to people and see that that day is going to come because nothing's getting better. It's only getting worse. And we don't want that to happen. That's why we're doing this. That's why I've dedicated my life. And that's why uh, uh, I've um, suffered so much in my life to try to wake people up is, is to prevent that kind of thing. And they are dead set upon seeing their dream come true, aren't they, Will? They have dedicated their lives, their labors, and, and indeed their, their entire faith to this. And you have not exaggerated or overrated the problem at all. This is dangerous, uh, people. The, the, these men mean business. Uh, the Scottish Rite themselves have taken a public stance totally in support of public education by the government. Now all you need to do is look at how screwed up your schools are and then turn around and look how screwed up your kids are and you've got a big, big, rich organization out there with incredible political power and widespread influence that is supporting this current failed system. This is just one isolated example. If you are not part of the solution and you have even been just a teeny bit exposed to the truth, then you are part of the problem. That's correct. And and we know that uh, public education conducted and supervised and organized and funded by the government is one of the planks of the Communist Manifesto written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Now why would Americans ever support such a thing? The strength of our educational system before it began to self-destruct was that it was always handled funded and governed and maintained and approved and everything else on a local level. In other words, the school system in my town might be different from the school system in someone else's town 100 miles away, but it would be controlled, governed, decided, textbooks would be chosen, everything on a local level. Our schools did not begin to self-destruct until the state got into the school system and then the federal government began to poke into it and specifically when uh, teachers colleges funded by the Carnegie, the Ford and the uh, the Rockefeller Institutes began to uh, change what they taught teachers to teach children 
And uh, when that happened, when it became an organized, uh, funded, um, dictated to type thing, then it began to fall apart. And the less control on the local level, the less our children uh, are educated. You've, uh, you've hit the nail right on the head. As you've stated in your own book, Behold a Pale Horse, the, the, the true enemy is, uh, is not communism, but illuminism. When, uh, when the Berlin Wall fell and the uh, Eastern Europe was opened up, it wasn't uh, all the American companies that beat up path to, the, to their door to go open up these markets and make money. There were two groups, and they were both religious in, in nature. One were the evangelists uh, who, who went over there to try to spread the word uh, of, their, uh, of their religion, and the other were Freemasons who stepped in just the very moment that the communists stepped out. Already, lodges have been consecrated in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, and in several other major cities, and they're, they're just popping up all over. You, you've got people, very old men, who actually remember when the lodges were around before Stalin wiped them out, and uh, uh, they're bringing them back to replace the communist masters that they just got rid of. And the only reason that Stalin did away with the lodges in uh, the Soviet Union was because Stalin was a 33rd degree Freemason. He knew how he had risen to power. He knew what the organization was, and he didn't want them turning against him, so he got rid of them. Absolutely. <laughs> they're, they're subversives. They got him, just like Hitler, they got him to where he wanted to be, and he's not going to let anybody get put him out of place with the same tools that he rose to power with. Okay, well, this uh, we're making a lot of progress here. If you were to walk into a room and see two grown men hugging, what would you look for as identifying uh, traits uh, that would tell you that these two men hugging uh, were Freemasons? Mm, there is a, a certain patterned ritual that goes uh, that, that has something to do with that. It, it, it deals with the uh, uh, cha interchange of the of one of the most secret passwords of Freemasonry, and you must go, you must stand foot to foot with another Mason, knee to knee. Uh, hand to back and mouth to ear and then whisper the secret word in a very low voice uh, and uh, I'm not going to do any of those things I'm just going to tell you the word is Mahabam and I don't even know what it means but I do know where it comes from and it comes from the ancient Hindu religion which is the, the original pagan religion and uh, many of the other secret words in Freemasonry are, are, are of an exact same source and they call this the five points of fellowship do they not? they do you, <laughs> you've done your homework Bill <laughs> Well, it's, I, I know more about Freemasonry and the secret societies than most members of Freemasonry and the secret societies ever will. Um, and um, I was, as I've told my listeners, and I've, as I've published in my book, uh, a, a member of Demolay when I was a teenager. I went to exactly three men, meetings, and uh, Demolay, folks, is a branch of Freemasonry for children, for teenagers, actually. And uh, I attended three meetings, and my father was transferred to Japan, and I never attended another meeting uh, ever. But I do believe that that's what got me, in fact, I know it is, that's what uh, opened the door for me to enter um, as a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence many years later. Uh, when I filled out my forms for security clearance, um, there was nothing on there for the Order of Demolay, but I knew that it was a branch of Freemasonry, so I checked Freemasonry. And uh, by golly, all of a sudden, uh, things began to open for me that had never opened for me before and which most people uh, who are not Freemasons find impossible to enter into. And um, I was surprised for a while and a little mystified until I discovered the real reason. But every member of naval intelligence that I ever met was a Freemason, and most of them wore their rings. What are these rings? How can... How can someone identify the ring of a Freemason? Sticks out like a sore thumb. It looks a bit like a fraternity ring or a football ring or, or any other signet ring. And uh, on the very top of the ring will be a square and compass set in a, what looks like a large A shape with the square on the bottom and the compass on the top. Uh, forming what looks a bit like an A, but it's not. Um, you can tell how seriously one takes their position in the craft. The, uh, the Masons who are really there for genuine reasons, philanthropic and charity work, they have their, uh, their square and compass facing to them. And those that are trying to impress and, and enforce the buddy system that got you in naval intelligence and, and the back scratching whole thing, they wear theirs facing the outside to tell everybody else in the world who they are. But really, the only ones who really know, unless you were to ask them what that ring meant, are our fellow uh, craft masons. Absolutely. I, sh I shouldn't say fellow craft. That's the second degree. <laughs> uh, our, our fellow brothers of the lodge. 
Okay, folks, we've got to take our break. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this very short pause. This is William Cooper for Swiss America Trading. How do you Welcome back to the hour of the time. Will, you've got something there you want to say, I think. Uh, yeah, I've just, uh, I'd like to give a little message to my brother Masons out there. I know that uh, all those who are listening are thinking some pretty hard thoughts about me. You're thinking things like that I'm a traitor to the craft. Well, <laughs> I'm thinking that you're a traitor to your country. And if you think that I've betrayed my brothers, I feel that you've betrayed me with your deception. If you believe that I've broken my oaths, and even if those oaths are valid, something that I do not believe, I think they're null and void, well, then I just have to say this, so what? We all got to go. Now, my brothers can go quietly into slavery, living a lie, and burying their heads in the sand, or you can go like a man, squarely facing the truth and fighting for freedom. I honestly believe this, and I honestly believe that the whole nature of the craft is sinister. Wow. That's uh, that's quite a statement there, and uh, I certainly admire you for saying that. I had no idea that you were going to do that. In fact, you showed me the piece of paper just as the music was beginning to fade out and indicated to me that you wanted to uh, say something. So, um, yeah, wow, that's pretty good. Um, okay, let's get uh, on into the, the rest of the program. What are some of the, uh, are there other signs and signals that uh, the secret societies, Freemasons in general, use to... Uh, to identify themselves to each other? I've never been a member of any other secret society besides Freemasonry, and uh, <laughs> much to my joy and to your uh, good fortune out there, I have already told you most of the secrets that are protected by the craft, as, as far as the common layman of the craft will know, with the exception of one. And uh, th that is concerning Hiram Abiff, who is a, a bit of a patron saint, I guess, of Freemasonry, somebody they pulled from the Bible and turned into a character to, uh, to give a meaning to their, to their ritual. Um, when, when two Masons come together, one of the easiest ways that they'll come to know each other without having to shake hands, hug in the middle of the street, or do little foot dances, or whatever kind of nonsense that they're, that they're doing out there, they'll just come up and say, well, hi, Hiram, how you doing? Or, hello, Mr. Abiff. Or if you want to catch a Mason on the phone, you just tell them that uh, H. Abiff is calling, and uh, believe me, you'll get service right away. Uh, well, that's good to know. Uh, we, can, uh, we can certainly use information like that. Um, but we know that some of the symbols and signals and signs used in the, in the Masonic uh, order were also used by uh, the Knights Templars and others. So this didn't come strictly from this one society, but literally they are all one. What are some of the vocal signals, uh, uh, the speech, uh, what words uh, besides Hiram Abiff? What else would you say to someone to solicit whether or not they were... Uh, in fact, Freemasons. Uh, one of them that, uh, that that I've also come across, and I've seen this in writing, and, and it's it, it was a bit of a mystery to me until I until I, I sought some some advice about it. They'll ask each other if they're a, if they're a traveling man, and what they mean by and this comes directly from the old Templar uh, old Templar ritual, and uh, and it stands as a positive factual link. Of, uh, of the continuity between ancient secret societies and modern Freemasonry is they'll ask if they're a traveling man. And the meaning behind that is one traveling from west to east, east being the source of knowledge. Or illumination. Ah. It's also the point where the sun rises, which goes back to the first religion, which was the cosmology, where all of these religions and secret societies sprang from, which was the worship of the sun, the source of illumination, the source of warmth, the source of all life, the source of everything, rises in the east every morning, and is, in fact, <laughs> for those who really understand, the morning star. Is that not correct? <laughs> Absolutely, and that uh, that gives a great illumination, if I may, <laughs> if I may say so, as to why the worshipful master sits in the east of the lodge, and uh, and also why during the ritual when a uh, a young a young unknowing Freemason like myself is brought in and has a degree conferred upon him. He circumnavigates it as he walks around in a circle from all the points of the lodge, going from the uh, worshipful master in the east to the junior warden in the uh, south to the senior warden in the west and then back to the master in the east. He is traveling as the earth travels around the sun in a, uh, in a, in a circle of worship. And it might even be a direct reference to Solomon's circle. And, uh, and if you've told me yourself, uh, Bill, about the traveling man, that too has been used by communists, by, hasn't it? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, anybody who knows anything about the International or the secret society known as the International, the International, the Communist Party, uh, the International Socialists, 
socialism, if you studied them, um, the same passwords are used by them. All of these organizations are one. Socialism stems from the mystery schools. That's where it comes from. Um, you'll find that most of the mystery schools preach the tenets of the um, uh, of the Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, uh, whom, by the way, didn't just wrote it. They were the hacks who fronted for it. They did not make it up. It came out of of ancient uh, documents and and an ancient philosophy. And uh, the password is the same. Are you a traveling man? And that's how communists identified themselves to each other from cell to cell and country to country and, and uh, uh, kept their business secret. And I got that straight out of the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and in their investigations of the International, the International, um, the Communist Party, International Socialism. They're all the same. Freemasonry, uh, the Knights of Malta, uh, the Rose and Cross, they're all the same organization, folks. And one of the, remember, one of their tenets is, and in fact, Adam Weishaupt said this, the strength of our order lies in its concealment and in, in its many different names, appearing under many different names and many different occupations, sometimes even appearing to oppose ourselves. But at the highest levels, they're all the same, because they use the system uh, to coerce the people to go along what they want, if they want to change something in a certain direction, they'll look at the population, the society, uh, the problems that, that exist, and they will intentionally create, foment a problem in order to get the people to cry for an answer to that problem, which will be the direction that they want to take that society into. They will create two opposing groups. At the top of these two opposing groups will be their people so that it's a controlled conflict bringing about a controlled resolution or a controlled, a desired end. Um, and you, you guys better wake up to this. I'm telling you, you better wake up to it. You better pay attention to what you're hearing here. You better realize that this young man sitting next to me is a hero. He's risking his life to bring you this information, as are many other people operating out of the public eye. You may never ever in your life know who they are. They're working to save your freedoms for you. And sometimes I have to sit back and watch it. Why are we all doing this? Why am I doing this? Why is he doing this? Why are all these people doing this when most of you out there sit back and do nothing? I have people write me letters and say, I don't want to be in your mailing list because I might, that somebody might get your mailing list and, and they might know who I am. I've had other people write and say, what is that, uh, that symbol that's, that's over your name when you sign your name on your documents? That's, that's, that's the sign of, uh, of something evil, and I don't want to be a part of your organization. That's fine with me, folks. Um, to tell you what that is, for those of you who are interested, that's a chop. It was given to me as a gift by the head of the accounting department of the last college where I was the executive director. She was Chinese, went home to Hong Kong for Christmas, and brought that back for me. That's the way the Chinese people sign their name. It literally means the director, the boss. And uh, I've used it ever since because it's I, I like it. And I liked her, and it was a gift. And it personalizes my signature. It means nothing more or less than that. But you are right in asking, but you are wrong in assuming and making assumptions. You're also wrong in hiding. I want you to read my lips. New world order. There's no place where you can go and hide unless you can get off this planet. And forget about aliens bringing all this stuff about. The only people you have to fear are humans. <laughs> and uh, uh, being afraid is not going to solve our problems because fear itself is a weapon that they use against us. So, I mean, why if... If the majority of people are sheeple and aren't going to help save their own butts, why should, why should you be doing this to save them, Will? Why are you doing this? I have a very, very easy answer for your question, and you already know the answer. I, it's obvious that you're doing this for the, for the sake of your audience. Whenever you look at your daughter, whenever you, I look at my family, whenever I slap my dog upside the head, that's why I'm doing it, because I love people in this world, and I love my people, and my people are not going to be safe un until I can make this world safe. I see them in direct danger. And, and I'd like to say, Bill, you have a wonderful way of cutting right to the heart of, of many matters. Uh, 
you're right about the continuity of the secret societies. They are all one. And, and I'm here to tell you, he did not just flip through a few books and see a couple of things and say, okay, they're all one, they're all evil. It's not that easy, folks. We have to read and research and research and research and investigate every single corner of this. And believe me, if it looks like a snake and it slithers like a snake and it hisses like a snake, well, well hell, go ahead and step on its head because it's a snake. And, uh, and, uh... <laughs> Uh, well, it is a snake. <laughs> if, if we go right to the philosophy of all of these secret societies is that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive God. That he was denied his own chance to become a God. And that Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free with the gift of intellect, the gift of knowledge. And with that knowledge man himself can become God. Remember the promise that Satan made to Eve was that God was lying to them. That if they did indeed eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge they would become gods. Don't ever forget that. Those who say they are God, those who say they're going to become God, the members of the secret societies, the Mormon church, others who profess this belief are practicing the Luciferian philosophy. They have deserted the real true God and they are following the fallen angel of light, Lucifer, Satan, who is not a God at all. They have all been deceived. If you are one of them, remember, we don't hate you. We are not trying to hurt you. If you want to continue to practice your religion, that is okay with me and any true person who is an American and who believes in the Constitution. It is only when you practice your religion with the aim of taking away my freedoms and forcing me to practice your religion under a new world totalitarian socialist government which you intend to bring about that it becomes not only my business but my duty to stop you. Understand that. And I want to read to you from a book here so that you'll understand where I'm getting to. And I want you to listen very closely to the closing music at the end of our program tonight. This is taken from uh, secrets, The Secret Societies of All Ages and Countries. It's in two volumes. It's, uh, the author is Hecate Thorne. This particular set of uh, two volumes was published, I believe, in 1965 by University Books Incorporated. The Library of Congress number is 65-22572. So I urge you to get this set of books because these books were written back when it was still easy to get a lot of information on the existing secret societies, much easier than it is today. Um, I want to read to you from page 14 of volume 2 under Secret Societies, Freemasonry, Rights and Customs, uh, paragraph uh, 391 entitled Masonic Customs. Some Masonic peculiarities may conveniently be mentioned here. Freemasons frequently attend in great state at the laying of the foundation stones of public buildings. They follow a master to the grave, clothed with all the paraphernalia of their respective degrees. They date from the year of light. The Knights of the Sun, the 28th degree of the Scotch Rite, acknowledge no era, but always write their date with seven knots, or zero, 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 zero. No one can be admitted into the Masonic Order before the age of 21, but an exception is made in this country and in France in favor of the sons of Masons, who may be initiated at the age of 18. Such a person is called a Lewis in England, and that's the source of that name, and a Louveteau in France. This latter word signifies a young wolf, and the reader will remember that in the mysteries of Isis, the candidate was made to wear the mask of a wolf's head. Hence a wolf and a candidate in these mysteries were and are synonymous. Macrobius, in his Saturnalia, says that the ancients perceived a relationship between the sun, the great symbol of these mysteries, and a wolf. For as the flocks of sheep and cattle disperse at the sight of the wolf, so the flocks of stars disappear at the approach of the sun's light. We have seen in the account of the French workmen's unions that the sons of Solomon still call themselves wolves. 
the adoption of the Luvatu into the lodge takes place with a ceremony resembling that of baptism. The temple is covered with flowers, incense is burnt, and the Godfather is enjoined not only to provide for the bodily wants of the newborn member, but also to bring him up in the school of truth and justice. The child receives a new name, generally that of a virtue such as veracity, devotion, beneficence, and the Godfather pronounces for him the oath of apprentice in which degree he is received into the order, which in case he should become an orphan, supports and establishment establishes him in life. Now the key words here, folks, that I want you to remember and pay very close attention to when you hear the closing theme or the music that closes this program tonight is this, and I'm going to quote directly from it. Quote, Macrobius in his Saturnalia says that the ancients perceived a relationship between the sun, the great symbol of those mysteries, and a wolf. For as the flocks of sheep and cattle disperse at the sight of the wolf, so the flocks of stars disappear at the approach of the sun's light. Now remember in chapter 1 of my book, Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, there is a quote of these people who have declared a silent, quiet war upon the American people using silent weapons that goes like this. Quote, A nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent." Unquote. In other words, cattle. I prefer to call them sheeple, the sheeple of the world. And of course, if they are the wolves, if they are the wolves, then you are the stakes on the table if you are indeed one of the sheeple. Well, that takes us almost up to the mark. Will, I want to thank you once again, and since this is the last uh, program that we're going to be doing together for quite a while, I'm going to give you the next uh, 30 seconds to um, tell the people out there, the sheeple, what they should hear. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, there's only one message for the sheeple of the America, of America, and that is, bah. As for my family, I love you. And, and we're out of time once again. For all of you who have been helping in this great fight, God bless you. For the rest of you, God bless you too. But God help you to wake up in time. Good night. <laughs>